We are in a series called The Crossing is a Joke, where we're looking at different kind of comedy clips and pairing it with scripture and then um, unpacking maybe a spiritual truth out of that. And so uh, today uh, um, we're going to look at a, it's, it's not a well-known, this guy's not a well-known comic at all, but I think the bit that he does in terms of, as we look at this whole process and the thing around trust, how do we trust? Who do we trust? Um, what does it mean to trust God? How do we trust other people? Um, there's all this kind of research that I'll just kind of put out in a, in a general way that, that says um, how we uh, internalize this dynamic is probably one of the most important factors of our spiritual and relational lives. And so um, I thought today maybe we would continue on as we talk about how we form a spiritual maturity a maturity that kind of moves us beyond uh, just head knowledge, but a, a type of spiritual maturity that summons us into becoming someone different in this world. That often when Jesus shows up, um, there's a reordering of our social and emotional relationships. And that that is what um, Eugene Peterson, who wrote the message, uh, translated the Bible into the message, the text that we'll read today is from there. Um, wrote a book called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction, which I think is really reflective of our spiritual life together. Often we um, understand conversion, me turning my will and my life over to the care of Jesus as something that then I get a zap. Now, I, um, William James wrote The Variety of Religious Experiences way back when, and he says for some people that's really true. Some people, there's like this instantaneous kind of, uh, you know, road to Damascus. Um, but for others of us, it is um, one step forward, two steps back, it feels like, in our change, in our desire, in our connection between our, the behaviors that are ingrained within us and what God might be doing in our lives. And so I think both of those are legitimate. Um, I just have found the way that um, often it appears in me is a long obedience, learning how to trust, learning how to build relationships um, that are deeper and longer over time. And so we're going we're gonna to look at that today. It wasn't the best, but I thought it was funny. My wife was like, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> there's, something, um, there's something about, I think, trust and betrayal. That idea that you fool me once, the shame's on me. And I don't know about you, but once the shame's on me, I can't get out of the shame, right? Um, I've often thought that it's not fear that is my uh, deepest experience as a human being. It might be shame. And there's something about shame and betrayal that, uh, and betrayal and trust that are in this, uh, this dance together. And then we come to this relationship with God, and we're supposed to kind of Texas hold them with God, put all of our trust in God, when there's a sense in which I don't know if I could trust this, this, this being. Because I don't know if I can trust another person. And so I think that trust, and if you've ever, if you have ever experienced betrayal, either as the betrayer or the one that's been betrayed, it's a primal wound, and it creates a wound that's really, one, I think, very difficult to talk about. Um, we don't talk about that much. I mean, there's not a, a place often where we can talk about the primary places that we've been wounded in that. Because I think also that, um, um, that betrayal and love are sown in the same uh, soil, that a person that you don't know can't betray you. It's only a person that you've let in that can betray you. Um, and because of that, often betrayal is a betrayal of love, of a deep friendship. And if that's ever happened uh, to you, if that's been a place where you've trusted and have felt uh, a wound in that trust uh, over time, then often when it comes time to trust again, there's a wound that then we build up kind of these, these mechanisms of defenses and we keep people out. And because of that, there is a, um, um, a types often of anxiety and depression that set in. 
And so I think at the very core of our lives, this, uh, this notion of trust is a deeply spiritual notion that's connected uh, to other people and to, um, uh, to other things. Um, could we, um, who's got the scripture today? That's, oh, Joe, you've got it. We're going to look at a scripture um, out, of, uh, uh, out of Matthew. This is from Matthew 14. Can you turn on the, uh, the microphone? Oh. Yeah. This is from... yeah. Do you have the microphone? No, I don't. Oh, I do have it. <laughs> Sorry about that, Joe. <laughs> Read this with me. Matthew 14, as soon as the meal was finished, he insisted that the disciples get in the boat and go on ahead to the other side. And while he dismissed the people with the crowd dispersed, he climbed the mountain so that he could be by himself and pray. He stayed there alone late into the night. Meanwhile, the boat was far out of the sea. When the wind came up against them and they were battered by the waves, at, the, at about four o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. They were scared to death. A ghost, they said, crying out in terror. <clears throat> but Jesus was quick to comfort them. Courage, it's me. Don't be afraid. Peter suddenly boldly said, Master, if it's the real you, call me to come to you on the water. He said, come ahead. Jumping out of the boat, Peter walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he looked down at the waves churning beneath his feet, he lost his nerve and started to sink. He cried, Master, save me. Jesus did, didn't hesitate. He reached down and grabbed his hand. Then he said, faint heart, what got into you? The two of them climbed into the boat, and the wind died down. The disciples in the boat, having watched the whole thing, worshipped Jesus, saying, this is it. You are God's son for sure. There's something about this uh, this text that um, I think is beyond um, just the uh, the obvious walking on water. There's a sense in which, in this relationship with Jesus and his disciples, there is a, a summonsing to a deeper place of trust. And when I think about the boat that they're on and I think about what they see and I think about then what Peter says, hey, I, I, I want to move towards you, that often the move towards Jesus is a call to something that's unsustainable with our own eyes. Is it the call to step out and to um, become the people that we want to be? The call to... Um, Somehow surrender our life and our will to the care of God. Somehow to, to move into a greater depth of spiritual maturity. Often requires that we step out of things that seem to sustain to something that does not sustain. And in the economy of God, the thing that does not sustain becomes sustainable. We take a risk. We'll talk about that in a second. Which is just another word for faith. And so often in uh, primary relationships when we are wounded, the place where Jesus calls us out of the boat, uh, the boat of our own defense mechanisms, the boat of keeping people at bay, the boat of, uh, um, of our own control and security is often uh, towards this, uh, this space that feels unsustainable and it becomes sustainable in the very spirit of the living God. Um, one of the things that um, I've said here before, and I think there's true, is that a poverty of relationships is a better predictor of health outcomes than poverty itself. This is a study uh, uh, that was done a while back. And so we're beginning to see that the relationships that we have, the social relationships we have, and the spiritual relationship that we have with God are somehow intertwined. Is that you cannot have a poverty of relationships and have a really strong uh, relationship with God, and vice versa. 
that often there's a calling out to those things get integrated. And that's the difference, I think, between um, a faith that moves us beyond our mental constructs of checking a box that says that um, this is what it means to be Christian. And this, this, this faith beyond belief that we talk about in here, which is an action that puts us in relationship with other people, puts us in relationship with ourself different, puts us in um, a connection with God that allows us uh, to summons the risk to step out often into uh, new waters. Um, and I believe that relationships are the most crucial investments that, um, that we can make in terms of our own spiritual maturity. Again, you cannot be spiritual mature and not be in the depth of relationships. You can go so far, and you can only go so far. Um, and I think that's why if we look in the New Testament all over the place, there's this understanding. Paul was just uh, relentless about it. Paul's whole concept could be um, uh, described and uh, understood that Christianity at its source, at its very cellular part, um, really is uh, um, all predicated on relationship. Right? Jesus says it like this, where the two or three are gathered, in my name there I am. Paul says, don't tell me how spiritual you are, and if you have something wrong uh, with your brother or sister, those things are connected. And so um, I think that we live in a world and in an age where um, that is um, something that we have to uh, really begin to look at in terms of what it means to be the church going forward. I think often the church has been a place where we have relationships, but we also program people out the wazoo because we want them to get to know the information. And often we come into even places like this and we can look at each other's back of the head and we're all struggling with something. My hunch is, is that all of us are struggling with something this morning. And that um, what we need are places to, uh, to know and to be known to be seen. Um, and so um, um, I think the church, um, as it um, matures more into this next century, has to be a place where it is setting up um, um, and maybe just relentlessly, relentlessly pursuing places where people can have depth of relationship. Um, it's the most crucial investment that we can make in terms of um, 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 our relationship with God. I want to talk just a bit about this adult, uh, the Harvard uh, study of adult development. D do y'all know anything about this? I, I didn't know anything about this until I did my PhD in human development. Um, where, what happened to that? Do we not have a slides anymore? There they are. Hey, look at that. Okay, was that not was that not showing anything? Was I just I was on my own, wasn't I? I was just. <laughs> Look at that. Okay, hey, guys, we have slides. <laughs> awesome. Uh, the Harvard Study of uh, uh, Adult Development, which I, is, it started in 1938. Um, it's the longest study of human uh, kind um, ever. Uh, um, uh, they're on their second, I think it's the second generation. They, they, they followed a group of men in the 30s uh, um, and, uh, and really were looking at what does it... Uh, what are the contexts and the conditions which make human flourishing happen? Uh, they started with 724 participants, um, uh, boys from mainly the, the Northeast, from both disadvantaged kind of backgrounds and really advantaged backgrounds. Uh, folks like uh, Robert Kennedy were in it uh, as well. I mean, there's some, some kind of big names. Um, and... Um, they're studying the descendants now of these folks. There's more than about 2,000 people that they're studying uh, that are in the study uh, on the second generation. Uh, they're looking at, in this second wave of, uh, of study, childhood experiences and the effect it has on midlife. I'm really interested in what uh, the findings uh, um, happen. Um, and what they began to realize, and what they say uh, now that out of, the, out of the findings of the last, since 1938 till about 2020, when they released kind of a, uh, an overall precis on this, they said uh, a couple of things. One, that as a society, loneliness is killing us. That there's a poverty of relationships that we have. That, um, that there is, um, and the, 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 uh, 
the Surgeon General has said it's an epidemic. Uh, and that epidemic is seen in uh, both anxiety and depression levels. It's seen in si social isolation. If y'all know who Robert Putnam is in the, I think the late 90s, maybe the early 2000s, he wrote a book um, called Bowling Alone. It's a, uh, he's a, a sociologist from Notre Dame. And just notice that, um, the fact that civic connectivity had gone down and social isolation had gone up, and along with that, all these kind of markers for, uh, uh, for depression and um, all these other things. It's uh, um, connected with, um, uh, they say that loneliness is as, uh, is a, is as uh, deadly as smoking or alcoholism which I think is really interesting, that it, um, it, it's a, it's a, it affects our mind, it affects our body, our souls. Um, they said the second quality, uh, or the second finding, is that the quality of our relationships matter. It's not the amount, it's the quality. It's not the number, it's the commitments that we have uh, to those. Um, and one of the things that they showed and have showed over time is that being in high conflict in uh, personal relationships for extended periods of time lead to really poor health outcomes, poor spiritual uh, outcomes, and poor mental outcomes. Now, I want to say, duh, right? <laughs> if you have ever been in conflict with anybody in your life that um, um, you are close to, you realize that those three things are affected. Your body, we carry this tension within our body. Um, I don't know how many of you, like me, that will wake up in what uh, Young calls the hour of the wolf at three in the morning wondering, how do I fix this? What's going on? This wasn't my fault. This is their fault. How, the, all these conversations that we have. And then it affects our spiritual life. Often I want either God to zap and make it better, or I think, where are you? And it uh, shuts down uh, often my life. And so the quality of our light relationships matter. Um, they have a deep impact on our spiritual life, our bodily life, our emotional life. Um, and they also said this, this last, that good relationships protect our minds. If you're in a good space relationally and you have, it's a protective factor against anxiety, it's a perfect, protective factor against a grief that sucks you into a hole, it's a protective factor against uh, addiction, that relationships, somebody in your life that you can know and be known by is the most important thing about us spiritually, mentally, emotionally, socially. And I think that at the heart of God is this desire to draw us into relationship with each other and in relationship uh, with God. Um, often we separate these things, um, that we make the, uh, our spiritual life and our relational life really different. Um, there's this guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer that I just love. He wrote a book uh, his, when he was 21 called Sanctoral Communio. Um, the communion of saints. And his take on confession changed my entire life. Um, I grew up in the church, and what it meant to confess was to say the things I didn't want to say to anybody so I wouldn't go to hell. Basically, that summed up you know, what confession was. <laughs> the Catholics made a whole uh, uh, system out of it. Um, the Baptists made it a real silent thing so you didn't have to talk, talk to anybody about it. Uh, the Methodists really didn't do it until we got to communion, you know. Um, and what, um, what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said is that really the things that we carry in us, and they don't have to be big ticket items. Some of us carry around big ticket items. Others of us just carry around a thousand different cuts that we don't know what to do with. And what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said is that um, um, when we turn God into this abstract force in our lives, um, we kind of render this relationship as obsolete. He said, why is it so easy for me to go into my prayer closet and to confess these things that are so um, 
have such power over me. It's easy for me to do that with God. But if I went to Charlie this morning and I said, Charlie, can I get a cup of coffee with you? Why is it so difficult for me to confess something to Charlie, if y'all know him, who's at least as messed up as I am? Right? Uh, more. Okay. Hey, more. Thank you. <laughs> Why is it so hard? And Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, because it's in my social relationship with Charlie that constitutes the real presence of Christ, where the two or three are gathered. This isn't about church. This is about human flourishing. This isn't about me getting to heaven. This is about me being a free person. And the, the way that the Holy Spirit has set this up is so that we are in relationships where we don't have to carry these burdens. And the confession isn't something that we, we do um, um, at, at a church or with a priest or with a pastor so we don't go to hell. It's we do it between each other so that we can thrive in our relationships and our relationship with God and we can be free. And this is why um, I think it's so important that we develop relationships, that we have these, that we cultivate these, because at the heart of it, um, it's a protective factor. It, um, it reduces our loneliness. It allows us to have a quality of people that are asking us about how we are, and we, we, um, we slacken the conflict in our relationships. And it protects us. Um, there's a, uh, there's a um, psychologist that I really like, Celia Bulk, who says that humans thrive in an atmosphere of trust. It's in that place that we, we, we thrive. Um, Erickson said that the first stage of human development is trust versus mistrust. It's what babies learn. Can they trust the environment around them? And often, trust is pre-verbal. Does that make sense? That it's before we have words called trust that we realize that I can be in relationships where my needs can get met. If there was a chaotic family that you grew up in, if there was things that even pre-verbal that you were crying out for that you couldn't get, that lodges within um, our psyche, within our soul. And we act out of those things. And often we get to places of, of being summoned like Peter off the boat to walk in a place that is unsustainable, yet God will sustain us. And we pull back because we're afraid. We don't know what this will mean if somebody knows us. And often those impulses to pull back are primary. They're almost primal. And in that primal space is often what the Holy Spirit wants to come in and heal. It's in that primal space before there are words, just instincts. I can't trust Charlie. I can't say this out loud. I, I, I've got to kind of not uh, put all my eggs in one basket. Is that we then begin to um, um, not trust. And often the summonsing of Christ uh, is to come to that place. Erickson says that there is a deep link between trust and hope. Your ability to trust someone else, your ability to, in that space, to, to in the mediation of the Holy Spirit, uh, to, to trust yourself with someone else gives you hope in life. And often there is despair. Often there is a type of despair that sets in because um, of our desire to do it alone, to not surrender in these relationships, to, um, uh, to be in control. Often I've found that in my own life that um, control, the desire to be in control plays a ma has psychic energy in me. I, I, I want to be in control. You, um, even before uh, uh, y'all got in here, we were testing the sound. There's a couple people here. And, uh, and uh, the sound, uh, our sound, Sully, our sound guy said, do you want me to turn it? What if I controlled it? And I was like, oh, no. Oh, no. I'm going to control it, right? I was like, oh, I don't have control problems at all, you know, just with, with the sound, you know. Um, often, that's the way that we move into our lives. When Jesus is constantly um, um, summonsing us to take steps out of our defenses into something that, that can't sustain, yet will sustain us in the Spirit, we pull back. And when we pull back, often there's a hopelessness that sets in.
Hope and trust are deeply related. If you can trust someone, there might be hope for the future. Um, And I think that that's an important correlation. And so trust is this choosing to risk something you value vulnerable to another person. This is the way that trust is built. I'll say that again. It's, it's choosing to risk something you value vulnerable to another person. That's how you build trust. Something that you feel vulnerable. And it doesn't, again, it's often odd what we um, consider to be vulnerable. There are big ticket items of vulnerability, and then there are small ticket items. Um, And we are called in human relationships and Christianity and our walk with each other to choose to risk something you value vulnerable to another person. When distrust sets in, distrust is basically uh, what is important, hidden, or difficult is not, I feel like it's not safe to share. And often we get caught in that. And so uh, when we come to our relationship with God and our relationship with each other, there's an integration in these spaces. And for, uh, for us as a society, we are um, we're often given scripts uh, young, as young, uh, young children and what it means to be safe and secure and successful. And often many of us get to midlife, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and we get to this space and we think, why is it not working for me anymore? The script that I was handed as a child. Um, I have what I want, but really, why does it feel hollow inside of, uh, of me? And I'll keep coming back to what psychologists, to what the scriptures say, is that in the end of the day, often we have been handed um, a script that is keeping us away from the very nature and character of God when we place money or achievement or uh, climbing at the center of our lives. The Holy Spirit will continue to say, um, in the depth of our own relationships is where we find um, hope, we find resiliency, we find this deep connection with the Holy Spirit. Um, And so I I think... um, um, there's a couple of new relationships that um, I'm in, uh, and I'm realizing that there's going to come a time where, as, uh, as a group of guys, we're going to have to figure out how willing are we to go there, right? And I think that often trust uh, really uh, um, is like, um, like tacking on a boat, like a sailboat, If you've ever seen a regatta that uh, when they start, it's not just a forward movement. They go back and forth and back and forth as they they build up speed. And they'll cross a line, and that's when it begins. But they've tacked back and forth. A lot of times in relationship, what we have to do, and even in our relationship with God, is we tack back and forth a lot with each other. Um, But that tacking back and forth, we somehow sometimes get to the line and say, okay, I can share this. And then we kind of fall back a little. We get to the line, we fall back. And I think that's an important thing that we do as long as we are getting closer to the line. And at one day, we're going to have to figure out, okay, I can trust you with who I am. I can share something vulnerable of me with you. And I think that vulnerability is the mathematical mechanism called the Holy Spirit. Right? Right? I think that when the Holy Spirit shows up, it's often in places of deep vulnerability in our lives. And often what ends up happening is I want to be zapped by God, then take the step. Often what happens is that the Holy Spirit says, take the step, and then I understand the very presence of God in that place. Does that make sense? It's like courage. I want courage, then I'll go do it, right? Right? And then often what I'm learning from you and from other people, from my sponsor, from my spiritual director, is, oh, you do it, you take the step, the leap of faith, as Kierkegaard says, and that's where the courage comes. That's where the Spirit upholds us, right? And because of that, we have to get really risk tolerant. We have to build our tolerance for risk, which is just another word for faith. There ought to be people in your life... um, 
that have kind of a refrigerator rights to you, right? When we lived in Lubbock, there was a host of kids that showed up at our house that uh, ha thought they had refrigerator rights to our house, and they did. They'd just come and just uh, wipe us out, right? <laughs> I'm not talking about that. I'm talking there ought to be some folks that kind of just show up and walk into the living room of your life and say, how you doing? And you might have resistance, but you know you've got to go there. If you don't have that, you won't grow. That's the summonsing of God to say, I want you to be free. I want you to, um, I want you to walk in a newness of life. And there needs, to, uh, there needs to be that. And so there's a sense of risk tolerance in this. I want to say that there's also um, a paradox of trust. is because, and, and this paradox, and I think that uh, Brene Brown, or is it John Gottman, one of those two I got this from, is in this paradox of trust. In that um, we can't have trust without vulnerability. I often thought that what God wanted for me was right behavior. And that God was obsessed with me doing my life right and being right and doing things right. If you've ever had parents that instill that within you or folks that, that are, have a heavy hand about doing things right and perfect in that way, it does not in, uh, uh, instill vulnerability. It often instills a deep anxiety that you live with regardless of what the parent or the coach or the authority figure is attempting to do, there's often a deep anxiety that wells up within you. And so there is a vulnerability that God wants us to get at with God and with each other so that there can be a, a, a deeper trust. So this connection between vulnerability and trust. When Peter is stepping off the boat, he's at the, I think, probably... Um, Maybe it's the second most vulnerable place in his life. The first might have been when he realized that he, was, uh, he had betrayed his, one of his best friends. And in that place um, of vulnerability, we begin to see the tenderness of God, the love of God, not the authority of God, not the judgment of God, but the grace of God shows up always in our own vulnerability. Um, and as we wrap up, what I want to um, suggest is this. Um, there's going to be some sliding door moments in your life. Um, um, that's an old Gwyneth Paltrow movie, which I thought was great, by the way. Um, a sliding doors that will open for a moment, and you're going to have a moment to decide, do I take a step or not? And if I take a step, um, I might be able to go on uh, a journey with this person. I might be able to share the vulnerable part of me. These kinds of things, again, don't have to be big ticket. And, and in terms of our own personal relationships, I would suggest trying out, like test driving these kind of sliding moments um, with different people in your life. How are you doing? Oh, I'm okay. And then maybe share something a little that may, that may not be super okay. And then ask them, what about you? And see if there is a relationship that is built. Um, often I find that men of a certain age become deeply invulnerable. They have these sliding doors that open all the time, and they've never stepped through it. I met with a, a gentleman this week who um, is 80 years old who has held on to a secret all of his life. And that secret has built up so big within him that he began to wonder if he could even be loved. I asked him, how long have you held this? He said, for the last 50 years. And as we began to talk and share, and as the unexplained tenderness of God showed up, this man began to offload this and weep. 80 years old, sharing something deep with one. Never had met this man in my life shared with me a complete stranger he decided to trust, a moment opened up in his life. Um, I think the work to do is to walk through those sliding doors as often as we can, when it's appropriate, when we can trust other people. Because at the deep heart of that is not just the trusting of another person, it's allowing the very Holy Spirit to heal the places within us that are damaged and wounded and that we carry around with us. 
And so I think that the Holy Spirit is going to give you um, a sliding door moment at some point in your life this week that you might feel a nudge to take. And I would encourage you then to take it. Um, what I've realized uh, in that is that often um, our relationships don't die from one blow. They die from a thousand tiny cuts that precede it. Right? That often our defenses... Um, might happen um, at, a, at a particular time and we decide we're not going to trust anybody or that, that pre-verbal, I'm not sure if I can trust, gets in play. And we get to be a certain age wondering uh, why I feel depressed, lack of meaning, lack of connection. I think each of those things often can be traced back into our relationship with each other and our relationship with God. Um, and that we have to uh, work on those. And then here's what I want to say as we close. And this is probably the most spiritual thing you'll hear um, all day, which is this. You've, you've got to embrace the suck, <laughs> the, right? Yeah. Some of us want the suck, the terrible things, the stuff to be cleaned up, and then we'll embrace it. But often what God does is says you've got to embrace the difficulty, you have to face the things that you don't want to face, not so that I can shame you and publicly pants you, but so that in these relationships of, of love and tenderness, you can be um, returned to yourself. But if you're constantly avoiding pain, if you're constantly avoiding uh, being vulnerable with another person, if you're constantly wanting to be right, if you're constantly attempting to be in control, you will never be free. And so there is this deep, dynamic, spiritual um, invitation to embrace um, the pain, embrace the suck, and allow the spirit of a living God to meet you in that place and to begin to reorder our lives. You will never grow with God if you are never vulnerable. You will never grow with another person unless you take risks. You will never understand the freedom that God wants you to be in unless you turn your entire life and your will over to this God that loves you, that is there for you, that is tender, that is not there to judge, but to set you free. And just what would happen um, if we lived that way with each other? If this week we took one of those sliding doors that opened and we took a step through, if we begin to build relationships in this place like that, and we became the sliding door for another person. Um, that's the kind of church I've wanted all my life and kind of relationships that I've needed all of my life. Um, and I think when we do that, that's the place where God happens. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for your love for us and uh, your presence in our life. And God, we would ask that in these places of our own relationship with you and with each other. We might find a deeper place of trust, that you would lead us into that place. Like Peter, who's on this boat, oh God, summons us to a place that does not sustain, but with you is sustainable. And when we are faint of heart, um, would you catch us? Would you hold us? And would you return us to ourselves? It is in your name that we pray, Jesus. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you back next week.